Welcome you to the Grafton Senior Center, and we have with us today another uh, famous presentation uh, from uh, Mirac O'Connell and uh, Attorney Arthur Bergeron. Today's topic, as you know, is uh, Wills 202, and it's about protecting children from themselves. We are uh, fortunate enough here also to have two additional speakers today. We have with us um, Sharon McLaughlin. She's the owner of the McLaughlin Education Consulting Firm as well as attorney Jennifer, is it Liddell? Liddell. 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 So I, without any more delay, I will get to it. So we've got some very fabulous information and some lunch for you later on as well. Thank Arthur? you. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, Michelle. And thank you very much, uh, all of you folks, for coming uh, to the latest installment in the Myrick O'Connell uh, 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 legal clinics that we do here, uh, hosted by the, the uh, Grafton Council on Aging. We really appreciate the hospitality. Uh, we are doing a new program. We've only done this one once before, so this is, you know, if it's a little disjointed, that's the way it goes. You know, we're just trying to figure this out. But the, the purpose of the program is to really kind of introduce you folks to some s information that, t that we haven't discussed before. You, as you know, uh, a lot of the focus of the presentations that I do is on elder law. I do pretty much nothing but elder law, so it's focusing on dealing with the problems and the issues that older folks have before they die. Um, what we're going to talk about today are some more what we'll call traditional estate planning issues, but actually in some ways they're not. They're not the issues that you always hear about when you're talking about, oh, so how do we avoid estate taxes? That's not this issue. Um, it, we, we are talking instead about issues that always seem to come up and people are always kind of scratching their, their heads about, which is really for, for how to protect the assets that you want to leave to your children, how to protect your children. Um, regarding those assets. So, first slide. So, as you know, what we often talk about is Frank and Mary. Uh, Frank and Mary are uh, retired folks who have, or who, are, who have got three children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Typically, we talk about Frank and Mary in terms of their own situation. Uh, we don't talk as much about the kids, but today, uh, we are talking about Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Because, because the, the so, once, so to tell you kind of what the family situation is, next slide. So Frank and Mary have got assets. Um, they've got their home, which is worth $350,000. In this case, we've expanded their assets a little bit. They also have a place on the Cape. They saved up a lot. It's worth $400,000. They have no mortgages. Uh, they have C joint CDs worth $300,000. And Frank has an IRA worth $150,000. So their total worth is a million two. And by the way, this is like a really common type situation. If people have got a place on the Cape that they probably paid you know, not that much for 30 or 40 years ago. They often find themselves in this situation. Next slide. Uh, their goal in life, they want to live in the, their own house until they die. They want to be buried in the backyard. Next slide. And they want to leave every, in their estate plan. They, they've, talked, they've talked to us, and they've got a very simple estate plan. When one of them dies, they want to make sure their spouse gets everything. When the two of them have died, they said, well, this is easy. I've got three kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., so we're just going to divide things among the three kids, and that's that. Uh, but sometimes it really isn't. So, so what we want to talk about is a little bit more about Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. So Peter. Uh, Peter uh, is married and has uh, two children. Next slide. Uh, Peter and his wife are in a kind of a standard situation. They've been, uh, they've been, they've up, they have a house worth $350,000, but they still have a mortgage uh, that's worth about $200,000, so they've got some equity. They have some joint savings, $50,000. He has a 401k worth 100. She has a 401k worth about 50. They both have income of about $75,000. So they're not doing badly. They're not like wealthy, but they're not doing badly. But, next slide. There's some trouble in the marriage. 
you know, and, and Peter sometimes is getting along great with his wife, but you know, sometimes not. And so there are these concerns um, that, that, that Frank and Mary have. So if we leave our assets to, to Peter, um, if we die tomorrow, you know, what's going to happen? Right? What's going to happen? And when they talk to us about this, they say, well, you know, the issue is what's going to happen if we leave our assets to Peter. But actually, one of the things you're going to find out is, is, is even before they're dead, one of the issues is what might they be uh, leaving to Peter. So to give you a, a, a sense of this, I wanted to bring in Jennifer Liddell. Jennifer is this wonderful attorney from Myrick O'Connell. As I've said many times, what I love about being at Myrick O'Connell is that you know, I'm no, I don't have to be a general practitioner and pretend to anybody that I know everything, right? Because there were about 65 of us, and there's somebody there that really knows a lot about just about everything. So Jennifer knows a lot about divorce and is there all the time. And I asked her to kind of explain to you um, divorce really from kind of as a background from two perspectives. So, you know, how do you figure out in divorce, there are kind of several pieces, but how do you figure out the asset split, and how do you figure out the alimony or the actual payments from one spouse to another? And, and, and so you could get a background in that, and then how would those things be influenced by, this, the, by these situations? What would, you know, how, what would happen if uh, the two of them were divorced before Frank and Mary died? What if, they, that, what if they started divorce proceedings six months after Frank and Mary died? What if they started it five years after Frank and Mary died? What, what would be the implications of leaving $400,000 to, to uh, Peter? And then we're going to talk a little bit about, about you know, so what are the kind of the alternatives? Okay? So, Jennifer, about divorce. Yes. Something about which I'm learning more and more. <laughs> yes. So my name is Jennifer Liddell. I'm in the Domestic Relations Litigation Department at Myrick O'Connell. Um, so I handle primarily divorce cases as well as other cases that come out of divorce and paternity matters. Um, the reason that we're here today is to kind of explain to you how, unfortunately, you might be um, a part of or considered when we're looking at your children's divorce. Um, some of the issues when we're going to or looking towards a final judgment on the matter, we're dealing with the division of the marital estate, we're dealing with, as Arch Arthur mentioned, child support potentially, alimony potentially, and kind of getting that all resolved. Um, and when we're looking at divorce, in Massachusetts we have Chapter 208, Section 34, which is how the court determines what a, an equitable and reasonable division of the marital estate is. Um, you'll notice that nowhere in the statute does it say is it fair. Um, that's not a standard that the court uses. It's equitable and reasonable. Um, and so when we're looking at that, there are 18 factors that the court should consider when dividing a marital estate. And those factors also are taken into consideration when we're looking at alimony awards. Uh, the factors can be anything or are anything from age of the parties, length of the marriage, conduct of the parties during the marriage, their needs. And I think the, the two most important ones that could affect you potentially are what is the marital estate and what is the potential for both parties' future income um, and acquisition of assets. And so when we're looking at those things, uh, the primary, our primary means for finding those out are discovery. Um, we can also, you know, we can obviously look at the parties' accounts, at their retirement accounts, um, to determine exactly what's in the marital estate. And so depending on if and when an inheritance has been received, that can be considered part of the marital estate as well. If we're looking at a scenario where there's an inheritance in the future, if there's an expectancy of an inheritance, that can be considered as future income or future ability to earn assets. Um, and it's not something that necessarily is going to get put into the pot if it's a future expectation, but it's something that the court can consider when dividing what the court has in front of it. Um, and so one of the tools that we have uh, when doing discovery uh, for parents of children who are getting divorced are what's called a Vaughn Affidavit. And this came about in the 90s. Hold on. Anybody here hear of it, a Vaughn Affidavit? <coughs> Nobody. This is amazing. Go, go ahead. Sorry. Go. So, go ahead. <laughs> so this came about in the 90s where we had uh, two, two children who were getting divorced. The parents had been, the husband's parents had been generous. And the grandmother had given some gifts to the parties. Um, the parents had actually given them uh, a property to live in, charging nominal rent. They'd also sold them some land in Maine for a dollar, which the, the children built a house on. And so when the parties went to get divorced, uh, the wife was wanting to determine what was in the husband's parents' realm of assets, or what potential was the husband going to have for receiving things from his parents, given their generosity during the marriage. And so the wife attempted to subpoena the parents. She attempted to bring them in for deposition. It went in from the probated family court. 
probate and family court said, look, I, I understand why you're here and your concerns. In Massachusetts, we have a very broad discovery statute. We can determine or do discovery on anything that's relevant to the underlying subject matter, which again is, is obviously very, very broad. So, but we also need to kind of counter that against your expectation or your right to privacy in dealing with your financial issues. So the court suggested that we do a Vaughn affidavit, that we look at uh, the approximate net worth of the parents within plus or minus 500,000, um, how their, their general uh, description of their estate plan and when the last time that was modified. The parents said, nope, we're not going to do that. That's still too intrusive. They brought it all the way up to the SJC, and the SJC, the Supreme Judicial Court, ended up finding that the Vaughn affidavit was probably the best way to kind of to, to deal with the situation of parents being, you know, a part of their children's divorce. So it's part of the discovery process. Certainly if there are parents who um, have been engaged in, you know, in providing funds to their children, uh, gifting assets, things like that. Certainly we have the opportunity to go in and do a Vaughn affidavit. Uh, it doesn't even have to be you know, parents, it could be any other family member uh, that we can request a Vaughn affidavit from. You know, some of the issues we find are that if, there, if it's determined that there's a large amount of in intermingling between your assets and your children's assets, that might give us the opportunity to make the, the scope of discovery a little bit broader. But typically, uh, when we're starting off and dealing with parents or relatives, who have been involved financially with the parties, uh, we'll start with a Vaughn affidavit. So, um, you know, if you have any questions or, you know, if it comes up, typically we recommend that the parents get their own counsel um, to kind of review this and, and prepare this for them. And by the way, we're going to hold all questions regarding all this presentation till the end. 